This is the taxon, the tree map of holdings. Everything or most things are Magnoliopsida here. And then from the Ascomicota, they have a very large collection apparently about the Philum Ascomicota or Lecano, Lecanoromizetes class, whatever it is, <laughs> here. But now let's look at this different map. Remember this map, okay? In fact, I'm going to, no, I'm going to do nothing. <coughs> Let's go at this other tree map, which is different. Or should be different. I don't know. <coughs> okay, this map looks different and it's about the same data. Why is it looking different? Because this map is about the taxon names. The previous map was about the holdings. Most of what was in Berlin-Dahlheim were Magnoliopsida or Lecanoromizetes. But the distribution of names, the taxonomy is much more widespread. <coughs> they even have insecta here. Those are insects. Why do they have insects? Well, because they have probably insect pests, I don't know. And this is the Magnoliopsida, Lecanoromizetes, but then you see more fungus here, and then you have agaromycetes, etc. So they have a much, a, a large and wide distribution of taxon names, all right? Okay, let's go back to another visualization tool. Uh, what is it? I guess it's this one. Ah, you see it, perfect. Vesper was last year developed uh, the, by the University of uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, sorry. It will say here. It's a client side visualization that uses HTML. And it recycles a lot of things so from Vitsat. Napier, that's the university they did. Edinburgh. <coughs> and it has an additional benefit is that you can actually upload your own data. Vesper will analyze Darwin Core archives. So you produce a Darwin Core archive, you can submit it to Vesper and have it analyzed. You can load your data by selecting a Darwin Core archive, uploading it and see what's there. Although it's still under development and some things work and some other things actually don't. But we can look at the samples. For instance, this botanical garden of 10,000 specimens, Harriet Garden. <coughs> Let's look to the denormalized taxonomy to see if it works. Hmm? Oh, sorry. And it counts the types of specimens according to taxonomy <coughs> and it introduces <coughs> excuse me. This plot here, this is a star plot that is essentially or conceptually similar to the tree map that we saw before, but it's in radial form. It shows you the proportion, or should show you the proportions between uh, different entities, but rather than having sectors proportional to the amount of records or amount of taxa, it divides the sectors equally among what's available in terms of taxa. It can be uh, it's custom you can customize this <coughs> quite easily. You can compare two different data sets to see which one has more magnoliopsida, which one has less uh, agaromicales or whatever. You can do a lot of things that can help you point whether a particular data set does, has a particular, a particular gap. Okay. GBIF dashboard does general analysis on GBIF's data. This was also based on, on Javier's work, mostly. <coughs> Let's see if it works. And it shows you how the data set is a long time. If it loads. by a number, a number of very basic visualizations, all of them 
all of which have time in the horizontal axis and any parameter in the vertical axis. So you see <coughs> how the data set have been increasing over time. For instance, this data set here is the number of species having specimen records accessible through GBIF over time. Sometimes they have to take out data sets that duplicate existing records or things like that. Or the species by year of occurrences. <coughs> or by day of year. And they actually use this plot, and also based on, on analysis we, we did on dates, that pointed out an issue. Can you figure out which is the issue here? You've seen this. How many spokes are here? How many peaks? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. <laughs> this 12 one is actually this one here. Yes and no. If it was only the first day of the month, there wouldn't be peaks. There would be straight lines. So it spreads. It's a problem with the date parsing. But still, it comes from the same, from the same, the same source, right? Okay. Back to. Uh, So final words, and I'm done with this. As we saw in the morning, there is no single recipe to detect gaps. There are many recipes. You can do it in many ways. And you basically are down to tools that can you can use and your, your own understanding of how your data are and what you need to get from your data. So if you are able to see what you need to know, there's your, you are in halfway <coughs> through, but almost halfway through. Probably the most difficult thing here is try to, dis to decide what I want to get from my data. Remember that the right tool will do the right job, and the wrong tool will get your fingers smashed. You, don't, you never try to drive a nail with anything else but a hammer. Hmm? There are more, more fingers broken by pliers, or by gum butts, or by anything else but hammer, than by anything else. <coughs> Tools will only show features. It's up to you to interpret those features, what those features mean. And for that, you need to make often educated guesses. If you are in a DGA, in a data gap analysis, you will be the one will decide which tools to use. So it, ultimately, it will be your own responsibility. You can't blame the tool designers unless the tool is not working, all right? And I think that's it. Any questions? Yes? Yes, thank you. <coughs> It's first about the index you were speaking about. That is, I we obtain dividing the variance by the mean. Uh, yeah, that's the uh, uh, dispersion index. Sorry. Yes, yes. I would like to know more about this index first. Well, it comes from distribution theory. Normally, a distribution which is random. Yeah. Hmm? so it has no pattern in it, it's a distribution in which knowing the position of a point will give you no information about the position of any other point. So you know where a plant is, the next plant can be touching it, 100 kilometers away, you will know nothing about that. That's a random distribution. A random distribution is normally described by a poison mathematically or statistically by a Poisson distribution, which has uh, this very interesting characteristics. The mean and the variance are identical. So a random distribution has equal mean and variance. Now, what is a non-random distribution? 
A normal random distribution is a distribution in which by knowing where one of the eight items, one of, where, where one of the plants is, you can guess that the nearest plant will be closer, that's clumped, or will be the, the probability of, fin of finding a different, another plant in the neighborhood is actually decreased. So it's a uniform distribution. Or you might look at it, at, it this, at it this way. You throw random points on a forest. If by hitting a plant, you know that there is another plant nearby, it's clumped. If by hitting a plant, you know no other plant is nearby, it's a uniform distribution. And any, any clumped distribution will increase the variance for the same mean. The mean might stay almost constant, constant but the, large, the larger the, the size this of the sample, the larger the variance. That's what the index means, looks at. If the index is above one, you have a variance which is larger than the mean. And if your variance is low, it's because a small sample or a large sample will have almost no variance. That's the, and, well, you can test whether this index is significant or no, or no for instance, by running a chi-square analysis on the expectations of a Poisson distribution. So it doesn't have to be exactly one. It can be 1.4 and still be a random distribution. It depends on whether you have little or many data. Okay. Another question is about, <coughs> you speak about Poisson distribution and negative binomial. Mm -hmm. And what about quasi-Poisson distribution? Poisson distribution is just a mathematical distribution that explains the distribution, well, it has many, many explanations, but in the context of geographical analysis, it means that the points are randomly distributed. Yes. Hmm? Or rather, it's a mathematical distribution that explains the randomness in a data pattern. Probably Tom can give you a more detailed statistical description. Yes, <laughs> <about, laughs> uh, <coughs> most of the time we use quasi-poison mm. or negative binomial when the virus mm. is... Well, a negative binomial is one, one of the clump distributions, only one of them, mm -hmm. which is yes. defined by the negative exponent. So you, it's quite common to test for, binomial, for negative binomial because uh, negative binomial is relatively common in nature. Okay. So, if you have a negative binomial distribution, you know it's a clumped distribution. Mm -hmm. If you have a clumped distribution, it might or might not be a binomial, a negative binomial. Okay. And third question is about the software. You said that we could also upload our, the, our data. I'd hmm. like to know from which size we can use this analysis of the data. You can upload data to Vesper, mm -hmm. which is a now a prototype, and I have no idea what the limits are. Okay. But I know that you can what you have to prepare is just a Darwin Core archive. You prepare a, a file which conforms to Darwin Core, which is a comma-separated value text file yes. with the right high headings, and Vesper will take the file, parse it, look at the headings, uh, get the columns, and then do the analysis. But I don't have an idea what are the limits are. Okay. And could we miss the species? Hmm? Could we miss the species within the CSV. The species, sorry. Yes, could we miss uh, it just on one species that we can do it, the analysis? Yes, it, it works on, on, on records, on, on, on biodiversity records rather than species. Okay. So it could be one file from one for one species or for 100 species, oh. doesn't matter. For one species, your You're limited. three will be one box. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> your chronogram will be very interesting. Okay. No, the chronogram could, will, we, yeah, work. we'll work everything. It's right. Yeah, it's normal. Okay. But, any, but a taxon map or a radial map, we show nothing. Okay. So one single block. One comment about these last tools. Um, this is Arturo and a former student who's also been an instructor in this program at the Kenya courses. Um, this is, they're creating kind of prepackaged analyses <coughs> that are known and demonstrated to be very relevant to these questions. At the same time, all of this is, are things that you can do with whatever software is on your computer right now. Right. <coughs> right. In fact, at the Kenya course, in the data cleaning um, course, 
Javier Otegui showed everybody how to do a chronogram, those radial plots mm -hmm. with the spokes of the wheel spiraling outward in Excel. Mm -hmm. So I make that comment just so that <coughs> you don't feel that you have to wait for somebody to create it. All of this is about exploring data. That's true. And in fact, you can do these mm -hmm. things. If you can't do a radial plot, you can almost certainly do a histogram. Okay? And all the radial plot is doing is taking what would be a very long, skinny histogram and curling it around so right. that you can see the year around. <coughs> That's right. I can, I can, for instance, I can confess freely that when I invented the chronogram, it took me exactly the duration of a football match. <laughs> it was like this. I was wondering how to represent, I, want, I wanted for a way to represent data along those two dimens dimensions. And I took my younger kid, which was six or seven at the time, to his weekly uh, football match, uh, soccer, soccer match, and soccer simply bores me to death. <laughs> so I'm one of those, I'm one of those uh, absolutely uh, discardable parents that will not even look at the son watching, uh, playing, I, unless from now on, every now and then. So I sat down with my laptop and I pretend to, to be paying attention to the match and eventually I did and yelled when there was a goal and so forth. But meanwhile, I was simply developing the chronogram entirely in Excel from beginning to end within that match. It wasn't difficult. It was simply a way to find how to represent a polar coordinate, which turns out to be absolutely trivial trigonometrics, sinus and cosinus, nothing more than that. <laughs>